Right, welcome back from reading week or whatever you want to call it. A little break in the middle of the term. Um, I asked about the programming puzzle. So um, I'll, I'll put up the attendance code straight after this. Uh, this second programming puzzle has, has the, the feature. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. That's better. Yeah, thanks for pointing out. Now I also have it on the screen here. I'm uh, out of out of practice, you know. One week and it's all gone. So Slido highlights the question that got the most votes, but this is not marked as a correct answer. I don't know why it does this. It's, a, it's not that <laughs> there's anything specific about that answer. Uh, it just happens to be what the most people clicked. So I'll, uh, I'll wait a minute, let you settle. Um, attendance code after that one. Uh, and we should have some time after today's lecture. So. Uh, if, um, if everything goes to plan, good afternoon, we should have time for a tiny little hint that I'll give for the programming puzzle. Uh, this second programming puzzle, this exam cheat code, it has the feature that once you, once you have roughly uh, understood what to do, you will, you will know how to make progress and improve. Uh, but at first, it's, it's a bit of a mental block that Essentially, everyone I put this puzzle to had when they first saw it. And, and you need a little, uh, many people need a little nudge to overcome it, not everyone. Um, so I'm happy to give that nudge kind of late, later today. The problem with this nudge is for this first bar of people that haven't looked at it at all, uh, it's basically too early. It doesn't make it doesn't help them much. Uh, the, the feature of this puzzle is you need to spend some time thinking about it. Then you often get stuck at a certain point. Then I'll tell you something. Then you're probably unstuck if you're like the rest of people I talk to. Uh, but if you're in this first bar, uh, maybe let's postpone it till tomorrow then, and we start with the next unit. So um, if you're in this first bar or maybe even in the second, give it a proper read tonight or uh, on your way to uni tomorrow, but better tonight so you can sleep it over. Uh, re read over the puzzle, um, both the informal version and the formal version. And then you can either be a code person or a math person, both works, uh, but the formalization is what counts. Um, and have, a, have a think about how you would solve this or what, what, what is easily possible and then um, yeah, there's a bit too, too much on the first two bars for today. So let's postpone it till tomorrow. And I'll give you a little hint. Uh, the hint doesn't solve the problem, but it will make you unstuck. Some would promise. It worked for many, many people in the past. So uh, judging from that, it will likely work for you too. So for the fun business, and while it gets set up with that, let me switch over to this. This has been a, a good while. Let's uh, recap a bit where we are. And maybe go to the very beginning, the beginning of time. <laughs> In the beginning, everything was white, right? No. We're in the compression unit, and it has three parts, which don't, don't show up here, but uh, we looked first at this first part was about character frequencies. 
Right? We, we encoded individual characters and we exploited that they are not all equally frequent or equally likely to occur. Um, and then we looked at repeated patterns. That was part two. And last time we started this part three of uh, transforms, transformations on the text. Weird kind of functions that are invertible, so you can go back and forth, but they don't actually compress by themselves. They just make other methods work better. Uh, and in a way, the, the big interesting one I uh, didn't tell you about last time. That's what we'll do today. Uh, further down. Then we've seen this one text, exa this example of a text transformation, the move to front transform, where we always encode it by the position in such a list, and we applied the move to front transformation after each access. Whenever we access a character, we put it to the front of the list. Um, uh, the important bit I wanted to highlight again is, is this part. So uh, if you forgot what move to front did and how it worked, that's all right for now. You should, of course, uh, catch up for later class tests and exams and so on. For now, uh, that's not so important. The important bit for, for now is that move to front can be shown to do this, this trick of converting something that has low uh, local entropy, which means there's regions in the text segments that are uh, special in the sense that a certain character occurs there much more often than other characters, for example. That means that's what low empirical entropy means. So there's regions where there's lots of E's, and maybe there's other regions where there's lots of T's, or yet other re regions with lots of A's, and not so many other characters. If you have something like this, and you run that text through a move to front transform, you'll get something that has globally low entropy. Because in each of these cases, that frequent character is likely to be transformed into some small number. Because in move to front, a character is transformed into uh, how many things have been accessed after the last access to the same thing, to the same character. And that means you have lots of small numbers. And so you can compress the outcome of, of that with simple global methods like Huffman codes. Uh, what's, what's less clear is, why would we expect our input texts to be like that? English text doesn't really have certain regions where there's everything E's or almost everything is in E, and then other regions where almost everything is in A. That's not what English text looks like. So the missing piece in the puzzle is what we'll cover today, something that brings standard text, English text in particular, but uh, other natural language and, and many other types of data, into a form where this is naturally occurring, so to say. Uh, so much for the context. So uh, yeah, let's get started with this. Any, any questions at this point? Uh, are we up to speed? Everything uh, fresh in memory again, ish? There was a question on the live stream uh, regarding the hint that we postponed to tomorrow. I will keep it on the live stream, of course, so you can also see that or rewind it and go back at home. Um, there was a second question about, the conf about a confusion for when the deadline is. Um, I'm somewhat certain it is 2nd of December. Uh, some some people nodding. It's a good sign. Question? Yeah. Uh, December second. Yeah. So you have you have two more weeks or so, a bit more. Yeah. No. Uh, let me let me double check now, so I don't tell you anything. <laughs>
Oh. Slow in here. Okay, December 1st. It was November 2nd for the 1st. But the programming puzzle 2 is December 1st at 6 p.m. British time. <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> no, sorry. I, I was not trying to mix, uh, make fun of you. It's, you. You need to know the time, right? Otherwise, it's not and the time zone. It's not well defined. Let's continue. I agree. Um, yeah, so still two plus-ish weeks for that puzzle. Uh, and once you know what to do, I promise you, it's not much work to work it out. You still have to write this report again and so on. Uh, so don't leave it till the very end. Um, but we'll continue with that tomorrow. In the next section of our compression unit, we'll look at the most powerful text transform that, that I know of and that we'll present here. That's the Burroughs Wheeler transform. And it starts off as a, as a really weird kind of idea, and it's not even clear how to invert it. Um, but it, it turns out after studying this for many, many uh, years, people found lots of uh, helpful properties. So this is really a, a, a cool trick that is a kind of a, a threshold innovation in that sense. Um, it enabled a lot of progress um, in this space. So maybe uh, um, I hope you appreciate it the same way or you, you find it as, as interesting as I did uh, when I first saw this. Um, I call it here a sophisticated text transformation technique. You'll be my judge. The, the key property is it takes the text and it just permutes the letters in a very specific way. Um, and it turns out that the outcome is more compressible in the sense that we discussed in the section on move to front. Specifically, it has locally low empirical entropy. If uh, the input text has some, has some structure, for example, English text or more general is, uh, com has, has low higher order empirical entropy, but we didn't talk about that in detail. Uh, one, one other property that's not so great, actually, is that it needs the entire text up front. So it, uh, it needs to work in blocks of the text or it needs the entire text up front. That's why when it was first invented, it was dismissed by its inventor as so impractical that he didn't even bother to write it up initially. He thought this is totally beyond the capabilities of computers. That was uh, in the 80s. And he, th he said, uh, that idea is, is cute, but it's so useless, I'm not even, I'm not even discussing it with anyone. I'm not, I'm, I'm not publishing it formally. And, and now it's a standard method that we run routinely. That's also a little bit of a lesson on algorithms and theory. Things sometimes sound purely theoretical uh, until they become very practical just by things speeding up. Okay, but for here, um, you need to work in entire blocks, so you need the entire source text available. That's unlike Lampulsive. And uh, specifically, the BWT, the Burroughs Wheeler transform, followed by the move to front transform. So we take our text, we put, we make it low local empirical entropy. Move to front makes it low global empirical entropy. Run length encoding because there's a specific property I'll come back to. And then Huffman, these, these four things in a row, crazy pipeline, that's, uh, that's behind the BZIP program. It's not so well known, but it's a standard program on Unix. And you can use that to compress. And to convince you that it's powerful, I took some, version, some English version of the Bible. So it's uh, 4 million characters. It's just as a text file, just the, the plain text. If you do something like gzip, then you get it down to a quarter of that, roughly. If you use 7-zip, maybe something uh, people know as, by and large, often a good compressor. It's, it's a bit more slow. It's a bit slower, but uh, often gives good compression. That brings it down further, but bzip gets even even further and is is faster than 7-zip. So it's uh, for English text at least, it's usually the best method in, by being fast and small. Now <laughs> I wanted to add this is something um, it's a bit out of out of the competition here because nobody's seriously using this, but you can go further. 
Remember the Hutter price that I mentioned at the beginning of this section of this unit, uh, where there's a price for compressing a, a chunk of Wikipedia text, and you can even earn half a million. Um, that was one of the competitors. It's no longer the best uh, tool, but it's one of those that are general purpose, uh, the pack compressor. It takes six minutes for this four megabyte text file. And after thinking for a very long time, it finds an indeed smaller representation. So there, you can do better than what I presented here, the BZIP program. But if you also want a reasonable compression time, then uh, there's usually nothing better. But for, uh, for completeness, I think this, this belongs on the slide as well. So what is the BWT? I hyped it up enough, I guess. Uh, we need one definition before we can get started, and that's the notion of a cyclic shift. It's a very simple thing, though. Imagine you have a, a, a text, and now you write this uh, along a circle, and you just close the loop. So a standard string is a cyclic string plus a starting position, right, where you know this is where I'm starting, and then I read in that direction. A cyclic shift is the same, same circle, but I start at a different position. You can also explain it. You can take a bunch of characters from the beginning and move them to the end. That's the, the other thing that happened. And of course, you can do that with any number of characters. It doesn't have to be at a word boundary. That's just to make a, a more fun example. That's a cyclic shift. Um, yeah, that's, that's a nice one. So we'll come back to this in unit eight. Uh, the, uh, you, can make this <clears throat> you can make the cyclic shift unique, uh, uniquely re you can make the text uniquely reconstructable from, the cyclic sh from any cyclic shift by adding a special character end of string. Um, we'll do that a lot in unit eight um, for a similar reason, a uh, slightly different reason. But if you, if you imagine you have a, a special marker that tells you this is the end of the string, then whatever cyclic shift you take, you still know where the original end of the string was, and you can just unshift it. So we can recover uh, the original text from that then. <clears throat> and that's what the Burris Wheeler transform also does. Uh, we do, from now on implicitly, we'll always have this end of string marker at the end of our string. All of the strings in this subsection will have that. And the examples will, will duly show this dollar symbol. By the way, dollar is just so, somehow, that's the convention. Um, it's supposed to be a character that comes before everything lexicographically. So we, we assume this is smaller in the alphabet than all the other characters. Uh, that happens to be the case if you put if you use ASCII characters, but of course, yeah, uh, only with the letters, the standard letters. Uh, theoretically, it's just any letter. You can pick whatever you want. Um, that's just the convention to show it as a dollar. <coughs> then, what does the Burr Wheeler trans Burr's Wheeler transform really do? It takes all the cyclic shifts of its of a string. So um, I'll have an example on the next slide. <clears throat> you sort them lexicographically as strings, uh, treating the dollar smaller than anything. And then you take the last column of what you get. <coughs> so here's an example. Um, it's this very, very uh, helpful but real text, alpha eats alpha alpha. Now you get all cyclic shifts by letting this dollar symbol slide forward. And of course, then anything that's pushed out of the left side is uh, appended at the end. That's all cyclic shifts. If we sort them, what we get is this. <clears throat> and you see here, the dollar is the smallest. Then come all the spaces, then A, E, F, and so on. And whenever we have a tie, everything that starts with an A here, we sort by the second letter, and so on. Right? The, if there's ties with the second and th third letter even, you keep going. That's lexicographic sorting of strings. Um, OK, and the last bit is take the last column. So we just read that column top to bottom. 
and that's the Burroughs Wheeler transform. So spelled out here like this. Um, first observation, that has to be a permutation of the original characters uh, because here, <coughs> any column I pick in this, in this matrix has each position of the text exactly once because we shifted everything through by one position here. So any column has each position of the text exactly once. Now, when I take here, what I do by sorting is just reordering rows. I swap two rows or put one further up. That doesn't change the property that every column has each position exactly once. And so in particular for the last column here, it has every character of the original text exactly once, but scrambled up. And in particular, this is what you get in this case. If you think about how to compute this and how to compute it efficiently, uh, it is in the end possible to do it in linear time. So you're, uh, you can essentially produce the BWT in the same time as you need to read the text. This is totally non-obvious though, if you go from the definition. Uh, you may recall unit three on sorting where we discussed even this lower bound for sorting arbitrary things by comparisons. And there we said, ah, you need, you need at least n log n comparisons if you need n, if you need elements sorted and there's n in total. And here we have n different things. If the text is n long, you have n different cyclic shifts. How can you get down to just linear? Actually, things are even worse because um, one comparison between two strings of length n could take time n. If I have two strings that have the same character, I keep comparing and they always have the same character, I have to continue checking. If I don't do, thing, don't, don't do anything smart, I might need linear time for each comparison. Uh, and so it could even be n squared log n with a, a standard comparison-based method. Um, but in, 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 in a way, there's n squared characters in this grid, in this matrix. So it feels like even to just read the entire matrix, you need n squared time. So how on earth, <clears throat> how on earth are you going to get this down to linear? Uh, short answer is we'll see later. Uh, as a little precursor of why that should be even possible, is that, as you can see here, these characters are not really random, right? Uh, this, this matrix here has a lot of structure. These diagonals are all the same characters. So it, it is only possible to speed that up that much because these are all the suffixes of one big string. They're not arbitrarily chosen strings. Okay, but for now, let's ignore how to do this in detail. We'll come back to this and spend uh, a good deal of our time somewhat soon on this. For now, let's just assume we can compute it um, and see what we can do with this. Now, if you look at this a bit more closely, the BWT, this last column, so this is just the same example from before. Mm. Uh, we can observe a few things. So if, um, if I have occurrences like in this string, there's alf, alf, and alf, that occurs three times. So I also have alf here, then I have another alf here. So that's the shifts where this alf is moved to the beginning. When I sort those three, the three will go together because they start with the same thing. And so indeed, they're all together in, on the right. And so what is in the column at the end for these three occurrences of ALF. Well, it's a cyclic shift, so what comes before this moves around to the, other, to the end. So the character that precedes the occurrences of ALF are in the, last, in the last column. So here's a different example. This character sequence LF in this string is always preceded by an A because it's always ALF. Uh, and that means <coughs> we get a, a group of A's when we look at all the occurrences of, uh, let me maybe use a different color here. So if we look at the L, LF, then we get three A's 
at the back because that's always what precedes LF. So we get a certain grouping. Now remember when I said BWT gives you a locally low entropy? That's exactly that. If I have all A's, that's minimal entropy locally. It's, it's the same character repeated all over. Mm. A bit more generally, we can, we can say there's context, so there's certain substrings that occur several times. And if I, if I mark them here, I get whatever precedes them on the right group together. Uh, and as a special case, what we've just seen, if I have a, a whole substring that literally occurs several times in the overall string, then I get a run in B of these preceding characters. So run here in the sense of, of run length encoding again, uh, run of the same character is just that character repeated. Uh, and so uh, I, was, I was trying to give you some statement here, but I then found it too much of a detour to make it formal. So let's just keep it with this, with this vague statement. If in the text that you're given, that you start with the source text, it's possible to predict what comes before a certain context. So you have a certain context, a certain substring. If that makes it easy to predict what comes before that, con that substring, uh, then the burroughs wheeler transform has locally low entropy by this grouping condition. And so what does this predicting like uh, look like? For example, in English, if I tell you I have the letters uh, H and E, what might come before H and E? Well, it's not, it's not obvious there's different options, but it's likely it could be a space because then it's he, or it could be a T, then it's an article, or it could be an S, then it's the pronoun she. There's a few options, but there's many options that are not plausible. It's probably not common to have a Z or a Q. I mean, Q is almost always followed by U. So there's a few things that you can rule out, meaning that there is a certain predictability from the context. OK, let's make this um, a bit more concrete in a bigger example. I hope it's still readable. So that's the text is not a super useful text, but I tried to find an example that's not tiny, but also still has lots of repeated parts so that something interesting happens. If you compute the burst wheeler transform, then that's this. And if you apply the move to front rule of, of the BWT, that's the result, okay? Uh, and what you see is there's a, lots of, there's a lot of zeros in the move to front transform of the BWT here. Essentially, half of the thing is zeroed out. And that obviously makes it compressible. That's, that's what much of the compressibility comes from. Um, the other thing, it's over, well, over all 24 characters in principle, at least. Uh, and it has spaces and so on sprinkled in. So it could have large numbers, like uh, here we had a 10 and an 8. But most numbers that occur are small, uh, relatively small. That again adds to the compressibility. And that's uh, indeed a general thing. It's not just in this uh, high hypothetical text. If you make a, a larger text and compress that in one go, you'll find half of the output is zeros. OK, uh, time for you to wake up. Um, here's the same, same example. I can go back to the other slide. Uh, I wanted to be very precise and look very carefully at uh, these different options. So this is one of the read me very carefully questions.
quite a few more people vote earlier on the attendance code, so I'll give you a bit more time. Looks like most people are, are done. So let me show you um, what the votes were. Uh, there's various votes for various things, right? Um, now, the, the answer I had in mind was this one. <laughs> uh, but let's go through all of those. This is, um, is insightful, I think, uh, to think about the others. Uh, let's stay here when we can read it better. So. Specifically, the question was about this long run of ages in, in this. <clears throat> so what's meant is, is this, right? So we have a lot, of, a lot of ages that come in a row. That means they have the context here. I have to match this up. So they all have these, this context uh, that groups it together. Now, H can be super frequent, but still be spread out in the BWT. So this first answer doesn't really uh, explain that. Um, if H is always at the beginning of a word, <coughs> that would mean it's preceded by a space, and the space characters would be grouped together. Uh, but there are usually other characters at the beginning of a word, so it wouldn't necessarily be a, a, a complete run in the BWT. Uh, almost all words start with an H. That's getting closer, but it's, it's not actually uh, the explanation here. Um, because that would lead to a run of space characters. Uh, so if, if you look here, everything that starts with an H, the, we have one, two, three, four, five occurrences of H at the beginning of a, of a word. Uh, these are the ones that are grouped together here, so it would give you a run of these space characters in the BWT because the H is on the left grouped together. So that's also not quite the, the explanation. H is always, fo always followed by an A. That's kind of... It's getting in the right direction, but it's kind of the wrong way around. Um, because that means um, whenever, whenever you have an H, there is an A behind it. Uh, but it doesn't mean that there's not um, other things that can come before an A. And those would split up, uh, those would split up the run of Hs. So really the main, the main thing here, OK, the last one I'm not even like a, not even a serious one. Um, all A's are preceded by H is what we get here. Because that means uh, all the A's are grouped together here. And uh, if they're all preceded by an H, the previous character, which is wrapped around and at the, at the end, is always an H. And so you get this long run of H's. Uh, that question is not necessarily what what I would want you to keep in mind about the BWT in general, but I think it's insightful to be precise in a concrete example, just to know how, uh, how the properties of the transform play out. Um, that's, that's what the target of the question was. Now, interestingly, you can also make a compression method just out of the BWT, where you take the burst wheeler transform, and then you compress, like in this example, just the, the runs in the BWT. You don't even exploit the finer points of this low, local low entropy. You only express the <laughs> extreme cases of low entropy, which is a run. So you can use something like the run length uh, encoding that we've 
to discuss, but with one twist, you also have to say what character is the next one. Right? The run length encoding view that we did was just for binary alphabets, and then you know if there was a run of zeros before, then it has to be a run of ones next. Uh, but here you have the freedom. So you have to store the next character. And even in this tiny example, you see there's, uh, there's three runs longer than one. And in longer texts, if you take a big portion of the text, then that already gets, gets compressed a bit. And it's, it's something that was a um, bit of a mystery for a long time. People knew this from observations in experiments. Uh, it's, it's a fairly recent celebrated result that put this in, in proper connection. So it showed that the number of runs in the BWT uh, can be upper bounded by this expression. So it's, it's essentially the number of number of phrases in some lempel sif variant. It's not the lempel sif Welsh that we discussed. It's a, it's a variant thereof. It's a slightly different one, but it's not so important for us. Uh, time sum, something that depends on the length of the text, but it's, it's logarithmic in the length of the text, so it's a fairly small contribution. <coughs> so in a way, that's, um, that's, that's a cute property, and I, I think it's, it's always cool to see results that are very young. Uh, but the, the proof of this is beyond the scope for us. The BWT is a bit mysterious in that it sorts. And so you may wonder um, if this is a one-way street. And it turns out not to be, but this is a, uh, I think, that's probably a bad idea. Not sure what that did to the live stream. Uh, let's give it a sec to recover. <laughs> okay, so that's good connection now. Yeah, might be just a, a short in between. Good. Uh, I'll leave my finger off the off switch. <clears throat> in the last section on the compression unit, we'll see how to invert the Burroughs Wheeler transform again. As we've seen, it's based on sorting the cyclic shifts. And sorting is usually a destructive operation in that you cannot unsort something if you haven't remembered what the original order was. And so it's, it's a bit weird. How would that be possible with the Burroughs-Wheeler transform, which is based on sorting? And that's crucial. We need to be able to invert this. Otherwise, we can't decode our encoded text. So it would be utterly useless. Uh, indeed, it, it turns out to be a, a total non-issue. You can invert the BWT. But I, I want to point out that this is somewhat surprising. So uh, it's, it's not obvious that it is invertible from the definition. And in this case, unlike in most of the other examples where we recover things like that, I want to show you the solution first and then explain afterwards why this works. The point, the, my reason is the solution is so beautiful and simple that you're all able to follow the algorithm and it doesn't really uh, explain why it works. At least I, I think it's, uh, it's quite opaque. But the solution is so cute. So uh, here, here it goes. Um, you take your, uh, for the BWT is given as this array of, of characters. Uh, we have the assumption as before that the original string had this dollar appended before it was transformed. That's crucial, so we need that. Um, otherwise, it's an arbitrary text, and we only get the BWT. First step is form pairs. So uh, here's, here's an example. That's our BWT as an input. And the dollar here can be anywhere, right? Uh, for, the un for the source text, it was at the end. But in the BWT, it can now be shifted around. So that's one concrete example. Um, and you create this array of pairs. First, the character from the BWT, and then its index. That's what's written down here. Then we sort this uh, list of pairs. And if you were to do this in Python, it would automatically do exactly what's, what's needed here. We sort 
first by the first component, and among those that have the same character there, we sort by the index of the second component. Uh, and then the last is maybe a bit less clear. So we use D as a kind of a, a, a pointered representation for a linked list and just follow pointers. Um, let me show this in the example and maybe it's, it's a bit more clear. The sorting step, I, I guess, is, is clear. Also note the sorting step necessarily puts the dollar sign in the first position because I said this is supposed to be smaller than all the other characters. So we definitely get this for free. We don't have to look for the dollar. And then we just take, um, in each step, we take this number as a pointer to uh, where we should continue. So the first step is follow this one. Uh, at index three, we have the next pair, A and seven. And so we produce as the first letter of the output, the A. And that's all. Now we follow through from the seven, you know, we go down here. So follow that one. Um, we find a B, that's what we output. And we find a new pointer. So it goes through dancing here by following these pointers. Um, and it takes a while, uh, but eventually we'll find a pointer to zero. And when we've produced the dollar sign, we know it has to be over. And in this case, I mean, we started here, so we would run back into a circle. So <laughs> we have to stop ourselves here. But it's obvious when we know, when we find the dollar, we know that we have to stop. Simple method, right? Why does that have anything to do with the BWT? Why should that be the original word? It's maybe uh, not, not clear. It's true, there's, there's a sorting step here too. Um, uh, of course, I mean, there's no magic really behind this, but it's, um, it just looks, looks confusing. Pardon? This method is not exactly supposed to. It's a way of Well, from here to here, that's sorting these these pairs. There's nothing nothing special going on. I mean, the it doesn't do exactly what the BWT did. It's not that you take a text, apply the BWT, and apply the BWT to the BWT again, and then you get the text back. That's not how it works. Okay, it's not uh, it's not self in self-inverse or something like this. Uh, you would get some garbage if you keep applying it. Uh, both, both have a sorting step involved, but it's also very asymmetric. The BWT forwards the, from the last section needs to sort this matrix of strings, which is, it turns out to be cheap, but it needs a sophisticated algorithm. Whereas this sorting step here is trivial uh, you sort by one character, you can use something like counting sort for that. Uh, and the second component is integers, and these are also from a small range. So again, you can use counting sort. So you already know how to sort this, how to produce that column in linear time without any fancy tricks. Whereas for the other part, we'll come to the fancy tricks. Um, so let me try to explain a little bit the connection. Um, I mean, first of all, it's easy to follow the algorithm and compute it. So even though in big O notation, both are linear time, the, the inverse is much cheaper to compute. It has a smaller constant. Uh, but why, why does this invert the BWT? Uh, well, first observation, we decode character by character and we, s we can always find the dollar sign because that's supposed to be unique. It's the single character, single occurrence of that thing. And we know that that comes last in the original text. So that's at least an anchor. And we can use that as a starting row. So in the BWT, we can find row in the sense of uh, this, but also in the sense of these columns I had earlier. Okay, that's uh, a lot of clicks back, but let me brief, briefly show it what I mean. Rows in this sense, right? We can find the starting row by finding wherever the dollar is. So here in this example. Okay, back to where we've been. All these fancy clickimations. 
So we have a starting row, great. What do we do next? Well, uh, to get the next character, we need somehow in that row, we currently have the last character, the last column. That's where we are in the BWT. If we can find the character that corresponds to that row but is in the first column, that's what first step. Second step is find where that character in the last column is in the BWT. So let me draw it a bit schematically. We're currently in this, in this row uh, where we currently have this entry. That's the BWT entry. Uh, all right. Now the first step means jump to the front of this. There's some new character A here. And then we want to find where in the BWT this A occurs. Because there's some other cyclic shift that's just one, well, one A is shifted over so that this is occurring somewhere. And we need a way to find that. If we can do these two steps, then we can jump character by character through the BWT and decode. And indeed, that is what this uh, pointer following did in disguise. <clears throat> How do we do the step one? If we know the index of the column in the BWT, so if we know the how manyth character in the BWT we currently have, we know the index of the row. So we can know the index i, where we currently look at this, this thing here. Now the first column is all the letters in the source text, which is the same as all the letters in the BWT in sorted order. So we can just look in the sorted list, what is the ith character? No magic needed, we can just sort the characters. And the list of pairs had the characters sorted. And that's exactly what we did. And for the second step, we need a little observation, um, namely that the relative order of the same characters stays the same from left to right. So if I have uh, several occurrences of A in the first column, like in this case, four A's, then the same A's must occur in the last column. It's just a permutation of the letters. And the relative order remains the same. This A is the same as this A. How do I know? Well, I know the context in the string. So this A is actually the start of A ban and then comes dollar. This A is also the start of A ban and then comes dollar. So I, the letters themselves don't have an identity, but their position in the text identifies them uniquely. So why do, the, why do they preserve this order? Why is the first and second and third A, the first and second and third A on the right, uh, in the, the rightmost column? That's because they're sorted by the same criterion. So uh, the overall list of rows is sorted. So that means these era occurrences of A's all gave a tie when I sorted those rows, but then I had the next columns and maybe even further columns to break the ties. The occurrences of the same characters A in the right means this A is stripped from the context, but then the rest is the same. So this ban was smaller than N. So ban is still smaller than N if I take the A away by the very same argument. That's, that's all there is behind it. If there was a tie before for A, then what comes afterwards doesn't change order if I remove that tied character. And so that's why uh, our, our pointer following method only really had to sort the first column and keep track which row things came from so that it can do this, uh, this pointer jumping step, which uh, effectively gives this, this uh, Roman two step. Right, so more, more concretely, like uh, if I, if I had this A here, these four A's, and I keep track of which row they came from, uh, then I can find those rows here when I, when I need them again. So when I, when I have this character at the moment, I jump to the A by looking, I have the 0, 1, 2, 3, index 3 of the rows. And index 3 among the sorted characters is not just an A, 
I know also it's the third A among those A's. So I know where to jump to. All right. Uh, that was probably the most intricate part of the sorting thing. It's a, a little, um, you know, a bit, a bit of a mind twister maybe. Um, but that's, that's the, the climax for now. Um, the decoding uh, was much simpler, but both encoding and decoding take linear time in big O notation. Uh, we'll come back to what that means, suffix sorting. Um, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, as before, or as we've seen with other compression methods, the decoding is indeed much, much simpler and faster also in terms of the constant factors at least. Now, what can we say about using BWT for compression? Uh, it's, it's typically slower than the other methods we've seen in this, in this unit, apart from this PAC8L fancy method that is way, way slower and trying to find more, more patterns still. Uh, but among the practically used methods, BWT is among the slower ones, but that's less, of, less and less of a problem. It also needs access to the entire text, which means it needs a lot of main memory to keep all the text in memory. As I mentioned earlier, initially it was dismissed as not even practical for that reason, and now it becomes a staple method um, because memory is just not as pressing a problem. And uh, you get specifically from this pipeline a very good trade-off between running time and compression. It's also... Uh, the BWT also is the basis of more modern versions of, of this compression part. So in a way, that's, um, that's the end of the pure compression uh, evaluation here. But a second component is that the BWT is, is the basis of things such as the FM index, uh, which is a is a way to represent the text in compressed form, but at the same time you can, you can decompress it by asking random access questions. You can jump to any character that you want, which is, for example, not possible in a zip file. If you compress thousands and thousands of small text files and you try to get a specific one, you can, you can open the file and your computer will show you all the files that are contained in it, but if you open one of the files and want to see the contents, it actually has to read through the entire file. And if it's gigabytes of, of zip files, you'll notice. Uh, there's better ways to do this. They haven't found their way into standard compression tools because they're usually still good enough-ish. Uh, but the BWT is behind all these more modern approaches. Um, and so that becomes more and more relevant with uh, the topics that we'll discuss in Unit 8. Uh, here's a quick overview of uh, all the methods we've seen. Um, again, nothing new on this slide. It's just for your convenience to summary, uh, a summary of what we've seen. Um, and in particular, uh, the, the two new ones. We had a previous summary already. Here's another summary adding in these text transforms. Uh, it's just an excuse to have a few more confusing acronyms on the slides. Any questions on the compression part? That concludes Unit 5. So we'll uh, sadly say goodbye to compression. But it will, it will haunt us again in Unit 8. Um, yeah, let's have a little break and maybe we can do a few questions. I, I think there's super relevant ones. Let's start 10, 10 past. Yeah, okay. Like it's like evidence I'm studying here. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Let me read what I signed. Okay. <laughs>
So next, next to? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. What are you, what are you doing? Uh, it's like for... So is it a job application or something no, like that? No, government scholarship. Like they ah, I see. me curriculum. Right, right. Thank yep. Hi. Hi. I wanted to attempt my class to three and uh, instead of like taking i wanted to take the practice test first but by mistake i clicked on the actual test button i have to look up how to make that fat all caps red text blinking yeah. or screaming or so yeah so i yeah. couldn't attempt the test because i did not know what to do without it did you email me as well yeah, I yeah okay i'll you. i've I seen it on um, Friday. yeah I'll, I'll get back to you um uh, is there any way you can unmute it so I can attempt it again? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I only I only do it when there's some some technical issue. Well, it was an honest mistake. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, I'll I'll make an announcement as Please. well because it's yeah, uh, it's getting a bit overwhelming. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so maybe I'll give people a, a first a first attempt uh, for those, but then after this one. Yeah, yeah, I'll be, please, I'll be please, strict. Please consider it. Sure. Because uh, I couldn't do it and do it and now it's muted. Okay. And one more thing is that I saw this job post related to a post, uh, a PhD, a research assistant in data structures. And it was posted by you. Yep. So uh, is it still open? Yeah, we rec uh, we're interviewing a few. So there's there's two posts. There's a um, a PhD studentship and there's a, a postdoc position. Yeah, yeah. One I saw one of them. It was for three years. Are they both? They both potentially for three years. But yeah. the the postdoc position requires a PhD. Okay. And the other one is a PhD studentship. Okay. So how can we apply for it? Uh, so which one? Which one do you mean? Uh, the PhD one. Um, there should be a link on on this find a PhD website. Um, I saw this your a, a project profile. description. And yeah. That, that, uh, check check my website no on on the homepage. Yeah. Oh, I see, I see. No longer accepting applications, um, and even the link that you provided said that it's now closed. Uh, well, that's for the postdoc. Okay. Uh, the other one, uh, maybe I can reopen it. Uh, yeah. Are there any prerequisites for this position? Yeah, I'm, at the moment, I'm only interviewing people with an undergrad in CS. Okay, so I have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, where can I find this post? Um, I'll, I'll check again. It should be on, you know, this website, find a PhD. Yeah. No, I didn't know about it. Okay. Uh, well, that's that's where the details were. Okay. Um, maybe it expired there. Okay, I'll check it out. If not, I'll email you about it. Okay. Okay, okay thank sure. you. So, so yep. the next unit uh, in the next hour uh, will be unit six. We'll start a bit on this, yeah. Interactive tools. Yeah. So, just came to ask because I was not sure. <laughs> no, sure. Um, I swapped this around. So, if you looked at the old recordings, you still see it used to be unit eight. <laughs> But I swapped the two because it better works with uh, with the assessments. Unit six after this, right? Yeah. Thank well, you. yep. Yep. <coughs> so I had a late submission for the panel and um, I uploaded it early today. And then huh? I that I saw the email saying that the deadline was yesterday. Is there something that which for which for which one? one? Oh, um. Is there something that we don't? I, I, I well, it's it, the, you know the 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 original deadline was whatever second November. Yeah. Um. And I, and I asked about two weeks. I think. Since yeah. No, that's fine. It's two weeks. is tomorrow, right? That's, that should yeah. be fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Also, uh, I have to submit a report from the zip file to the podium separately. Because I uploaded it, I, 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 put the, I put the PDF within the zip file. Uh, upload it separately, please. Okay, I'll do that. So that it, yeah, so that it matches what we, what we asked for.
Right, time to continue. Um, let me go through a few questions before we jump to the next unit. Uh, I think most, most are fairly quick, so uh, I'll just run through a few. Uh, I think I, I said something when Ben posted on Campus Wire on this. We're finalizing the marks, and we're waiting for a few people who have extensions to submit until tomorrow. So I was uh, trying to be kind not to give feedback so that you don't have uh, a shorter time to submit. Uh, two weeks is the maximum that people give you anyways. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at finishing that, and then uh, sometime next week we'll, we'll release it, depending on how much, um, how much trouble we have of getting that into Canvas, but it should be fine. Uh, ben will discuss a few things about the assessment in the tutorials, and you can ask him questions. He didn't mark it this time, so because we're a larger group, uh, we split the, the job, so uh, I have two other PhD students and students who are marking this. Um, but they will give you some, some individual feedback on your questions, but you can ask Ben for general feedback uh, or what kind of solutions were possible for the, for the instances. Uh, okay, I'll, I, uh, you know I have to release those by clicking explicitly five times, so I'll, I'll do that once again uh, after the session today. I mentioned we'll, we'll postpone the, the hint for to tomorrow and I'll leave the live stream open so you can Definitely get the hint, even if you can't be here uh, for the class. Uh, we covered that as well. Uh, that's an interesting question. So I haven't tried all possible archive archiving pro uh, pro compression programs. Um, you're welcome to, to take the the Bible text file is from the Red Book, the book side of Cedric and Wayne. They have lots of sample data. Yeah, I just took it from there, so maybe you can you can also try it. I'm not aware of anything that performs better on this than bzip2 among the standard programs, apart from this pack that I showed you. Um, <laughs> um, in I think this is just because you sort the pairs by the first component. But if, if that was unclear, maybe find me after the after class. Any other questions at that point? Um, okay. 
So we were, in, in a way, even faster, so we don't have to rush this unit. We still have all of tomorrow to finish it. Uh, but I think it's good if we start the introduction part. Um, that also gets you thinking in the right direction for the, for the programming puzzle. So um, it's, it's a bit of a fresh unit, kind of separate from what we've just discussed, but it has some ties. It has some uh, connections in spirit, I, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, let's stop the waffling around. Welcome back to uh, Efficient Algorithms, COM 5 to 6. In, in Unit 6, we'll do a brief excursion to error correcting codes. This will be a much shorter unit than the compression unit, not because there's much less interesting things to say about error correcting codes, uh, but I think for an algorithms class, there is indeed more interesting algorithms in compression than on this topic, but maybe it's also my personal bias. I do want to show you a few, uh, a few nice little highlights of error correcting codes though. Uh, the, better, the outcomes are that you have some uh, understanding of the context. Uh, you know what's, what's possible there and the distinction be er between detecting errors and correcting them. You should understand the terminology of block codes. We'll come to that and we'll have essentially one concrete set of codes, the Hamming codes, that we'll look at in detail. Uh, and then, again, finally, applying the knowledge is more important than knowing all the details alone. You should be able to, to judge when that such a code is suitable to solve a problem that you're facing. Very short unit, as I said. I'll give a quick introduction, and then tomorrow we'll look at the what's not possible, and then what is possible. So I said there's some, some philosophical connection to the previous section. Uh, what, what it is about is um, we're somehow in both these units thinking about getting data from one point to another. And if you, if you do that in a computer, you have to encode things in bits, and then you have to get those bits from A to B. Now it's useful if you have few bits to get from A to B because then communication is, is faster and so on. So compression is often used to reduce the amount of information you need to transmit. But then for the transmission itself, you often have noise in the communication channels that you're using. Uh, we're very used to this. So when I speak to you, there's acoustic noise from the room, hopefully in the good lecture theater and with using the mic properly, not as much, but it's never zero. Um, I might not pronounce things very clearly sometimes or other people, uh, maybe I'm doing this perfectly, but other people aren't or whatever. Uh, make your pick, but you can certainly imagine uh, situations where that's a problem. And then of course, there's more semantic things to it too. That's what um, humans have uh, clearly in their forms of communication as well. Now we've also found ways to work around that. Uh, one option is if you can't understand what someone says, if the, the noise is too much compared to the signal, then you just ask them to speak up or maybe uh, repeat what they said or speak more slowly or various options like this. Uh, Often we can still make out what someone said despite all the noise. And if you think about this a bit more abstractly or uh, a bit more, more from the higher level, how, how is it even possible that we don't get all the information from the other communication partner from the sender and we can still make out what they meant? Okay, some of that might be, uh, we just fabricate a meaning that they may never have intended, but that's not what I'm getting at here. Uh, what I mean is our language and the way we communicate has a lot of redundancy built in. There's a lot of things you can do to, for example, the spelling of English that doesn't affect how well you can read it. Now, this, this is a bit dependent on how well you're trained with reading English. Uh, but for, for most, um, most people that have English as a first language, they can easily read this sentence and they can properly produce the, the right spelling. So there's redundancy in, in the language in that it doesn't actually matter if you scramble a few letters. You can still undo these errors. Uh, but then if you overdo it, 
Uh, you can see the something went wrong, but there's no way you can, I, I mean, it's just too far away from any meaningful sentence for you to say what it could have meant before. And that leads me to um, that dis first distinction on the technical side. Uh, there's a, it's a different thing to detect that something went wrong and to uh, just correct these errors automatically or from the information you're, you're given. So here it starts out fine and then you notice, okay, some, someone fell asleep on the keyboard or something. Uh, whereas if there's just a few little things, you may even not notice them while reading. Now, okay, I tried to keep the examples concrete in, in writing. The same happens with, with voice, right? There's this, okay, I'm not, I'm not so good, at, I'm not out of my depth here, but uh, I think there's certain variations in frequency and so on that we're completely oblivious to. If I have a more high or low pitched voice, you can still make out the, uh, the patterns of, of language and sound and pronunciation. Uh, so there's certain things that are irrelevant, but then there's this lovely game depending where you come from. But the game is you whisper someone in the ear, in, a, in their ears, some, some sentence, and they have to pass this on by uh, a chain of whispering into people's ears. And what comes out at the end often has nothing to do with what you started with. So people are very eager to correct what they hear into something that's close enough in, what, in meaning to what they, they think might have been the original thing. Uh, and we're uh, sometimes too eager doing that. Okay, so detecting errors, correcting errors, both things that intuitively we do all the time. And of course also the options are if you can correct the errors, then hopefully you corrected it correctly. Whereas if you just make out I couldn't get it, you just ask to repeat it. The same as what computers can do as, uh, as a countermeasure. Uh, you can try to build in redundancy so that you can still make out what the original meaning was. Or you can ask the other side, please send me that package again. Internet protocols have that all built in. Um, but that's a bit boring from the, from the coding side. So uh, we'll, we'll mostly focus on those, on correcting codes, but um, detecting is a prerequisite. Uh, yeah, to the computer world, so where does noise come from for us? Um, computers typically communicate with electrical signals, but that's not the only thing. Uh, so if you have copper cables, there could be inference from magnetic fields, electromagnetic fields that just uh, interfere with the signal that you get. Um, we usually abstract away from the physical details. We'll just transmit a string of bits. And you can think of different ways of what could go wrong. What we'll basically assume is that the time, the clock, is not perturbed but the signal might be. So it could happen that one of the bits was a one and flipped to a zero or vice versa. Uh, but we, we assume that the timing is, uh, is correct. Uh, it's much more tricky if you also allow that there could be bits inserted or deleted from your bit string. Uh, if, you, if you think about transmitting something across a wire, that's actually a reasonable assumption. You usually have a separate clock signal and uh, that is somewhat stable, whereas Inter interference might be twisting a bit to the other side. And the goal is to have a way to send, send data across such an unreliable communication channel uh, to still allow reliable communication. Uh, as, as for humans, we have the two options. If we just detect an error, we can request a retransmit. Um, sometimes, if, sometimes that's the best option, but for some communication channels, there's no option of resubmitting then you want to build in enough redundancy to correct it straight away. I think it's quite clear that you need some form of redundancy to correct errors or even detect errors, simply because if you have no redundancy built in, any kind of change that the channel does to your message, the receiver will just have to take as, oh, you meant this other message, and there's no way for them to know. So uh, you have to send more bits than the plain text, the plain message that you're trying to, to transmit. In a way, that's the opposite of compression. We're making things longer now, whereas we tried to make them shorter before. But you should think of them as going hand in hand. 
again, it's a pipeline. If you send something across a communication channel, you first want to compress so that the message becomes short, and then you blow it up, but you blow it up in, in a specific uh, judicious way with building redundancy, and that's helpful, not random things. Okay. Um, I want to close this part with getting your thoughts on two questions. Just now, I know that many, well, some of you maybe have seen this. If you've done some more electrical engineering undergrad, maybe this is, uh, I'm telling you baby stuff here. Um, if not, then you may never have seen this. Uh, and it's totally fine. So it's just your gut feeling. Uh, what do you think should be or could be possible here? And the first question is, if I, if I want to send 100 bits as a message, and uh, I want to detect whether there's one bit that flipped, um, how many bits of redundancy would I need to do that? What do you think? Um, I think I'll, yeah, we can discuss the results briefly, but I'll only really show you the answer tomorrow. Keep up the tension a bit. Yeah, maybe we should have specified. Just send one number, or uh, you can say you can send no idea if you really feel like you want to send no idea. Uh, but several people send so and so many bits and so on. Uh, send just the numbers so that we get a nicer, nicer word cloud. <laughs> All right, I mean, you can, you can finish sending your things, but because uh, quite a bunch of people are, are done, here's just uh, what people send. I won't comment on whether any of these are correct, right? Uh, we'll see tomorrow. I'm, of course, a bit disappointed that nobody said 42. Uh, so I have a second question, which is the very same thing but with correct instead of detect. So probably we need more bits for that. But other than that, maybe it's not obvious. So here's the second question. Again, just send the number, no, uh, no units. Unless the unit is clowns, I guess that's fair. I don't know. Well, as before, I said I won't comment on, on any of it. We'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep them on Slider and we'll discuss tomorrow. Um, uh, let's leave it here. If you, have, if you have questions, we can discuss a bit. Uh, we have some, some questions on, on Slido. Uh, it doesn't make sense to start the next part, so I'll, I'll postpone that till tomorrow. Uh, da, 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 da. So, uh, there is a unit nine, and it is. I, I don't know why uh, 
This sounds like you thought there's no unit nine. There's a unit nine, but it's the Christmas lecture for fun. It's not part of the exam material. Um, right, isn't unit nine extra? Yeah, it, it kind of is. Uh, check campus wire if Ben forgot to post them. Ping Ben, he usually does it at, at some point. But remember, only after all the tutorials of the week are over. So if yours is early, might have to wait a few days. Uh, the game of the year? I, I mean, no idea. You mean the board games kind of thing? Or uh, you have something else in mind? Um, the game of the year awards? Um, yeah, good question. I know they exist, but uh, I mean, I'm not involved. I'm not in the jury if you're disappointed or anything like that. Yeah. Oh, right. Uh, maybe I can say a little bit of advertisement for our competitive programming um, coaching that we started. You will have seen there were emails on this. Uh, a few colleagues. I, I will also at some point um, pop up, but I wasn't, wasn't uh, available for the last one. So we started coaching a little bit teams for uh, the ICPC contests or other programming contests. And if you want to join that, you can, you can come. Mm, I think by every other week on Wednesday afternoon is the current thing. Um, do I have the Canvas page for that? It's a Canvas page that you can self-sign up for. But it, it can basically just show up in the labs. I think it's lab two. And the next one is next week. The Competitive Programming Club. We have a name now. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the Canvas page. This um, is mostly to collect every, everyone who is involved and send announcements. Uh, if you have questions about this, find me. Good. We'll continue tomorrow with the error correcting codes. If you have questions, we can. Uh, I'm around for, for discussing a few things. Otherwise, you can enjoy an earlier evening. Bye, guys.